Hello, ice cream lovers. How are you? Yay! Thanks so much for being here. Um, I also want to thank our funders, California Humanities. This program is made possible with support from California Humanities. You can find out more about them at C-A-L-H-U-M dot org. Um, all the great programs they do, we are very thankful for their support. So I want to welcome our host for the evening, the host of How to LA, Brian De Los Santos, and LAist food and culture editor, Gab Chabron. Hello, everyone. Let us adjust our mics real quick. Um, tap, tap. How's that ice cream, y'all? Yeah? So uh, like we said, we are recording a podcast, so the louder you are, the better it is. All right, how was that ice cream, y'all? Hey, thank you for that. Thank you for that. Gob, how are you doing? Did, did you ask them to scream for ice cream right now? Did that really just happen? I missed that. I missed oh. that. But I did do that. You did. did. You yeah. did. And you did a really great job. Gob, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. I'm, I'm happy to be up here, happy to be talking about ice cream. Uh, we've got a great panel tonight. How are you? I'm on a sugar high a little bit. So you see me sugar crash. You know why. Um, I did taste all the most of the offerings. I have to go up for round two. And after we're done, if there's extra ice cream. Yes, I saw a nod. So there's extra ice cream if you guys want to round two or maybe round three. Um, I see children here. So you got to uh, talk to your parents. All right. And just not, not, not too much sugar rush here. Um, I do want to open up uh, with a discussion between Gab and I just talking about nostalgia. That's the reason why we're here, right, Gob? That's right. Um, I want to ask you, what's your big ice cream memory? Well, I mean, there are a couple. I mean, I think like most kids who grew up in SoCal, the ice cream man was definitely like a part of my childhood in that respect. And, you know, a lot of it was having to do with playing at parks and, you know, seeing the truck pull up, you know, hearing the music, mm -hmm. you know, it, I all go. I go back to that that Eddie Murphy joke, you know, where they say ice cream, you know, <laughs> uh, kind of everybody goes crazy and they start running towards the truck. So, um, so that is definitely uh, a main one. That I think that we could all kind of share in that respect. And it was funny because I was talking to one of our interns today, mm -hmm. Lucy Jaffe, uh, and she was trying to work on a story about uh, ice cream trucks. And apparently they're not as prevalent as as they used to be. Okay, uh, for a lot of reasons in that respect. So. But the other memory that I wanted to share, and I mentioned this actually in the preview piece that uh, for this event, was uh, in my hometown of Whittier, we uh, lived across the street from an ice cream factory. Uh, it was called the Kulaku Ice Cream Factory. And mm -hmm. some of you folks might remember, yes, <laughs> uh, that back in the day, they supplied the ice cream sandwiches uh, for Dodger Stadium. Oh. And they have a very iconic logo. It's a guy riding a bike, and he's got a white suit and a hat and all this kind of stuff. Well, um, so we got to be friends with uh, a family who worked there and lived nearby, and uh, they would actually give us ice cream. And there were a couple summers where our entire freezer was full of ice cream, all different kinds. You know? What was your favorite, though? Uh, well, I think the one that, that sticks out the most in my brain from that time period was uh, an ice cream. It was a popsicle called the Big Stick. And and it was it was a it was orange and uh, and yellow. I I don't know what the flavors were because I'm pretty sure they were extremely artificial mm -hmm. uh, sugar. in that respect. It was <laughs> mostly just you know uh, colored flavored sugar, uh, but they were delicious and you know made a mess and and, and it was great. So. I love how Gob's that in the front is nodding yes, like I know, like he remembers. Yeah, you know, you know, he, you know he knows exactly. About. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So. He might even remember better than me because uh, I was I was young back then. So, what about you? Uh, what, what's a what's an ice cream memory for you, yeah. Brian De Los Santos? A core memory for me. So I grew up in LA, uh, an LAUSD student, um, and you know we're an immigrant family, uh, not a lot of money, but we did have fifty cents for raspados. Um, at least every Friday, I would say, if not every day, and that's too much sugar. But at least every Friday, my mom or our auntie would pick us up uh, from elementary school. And right across the street from the elementary school was a raspado man. For those of you who know, don't know what a raspado is, it's shaved ice. It's really like just scraped ice onto 
a styrofoam cup um, of a certain size and they would put some sugar or some um, condensed milk, uh, just some toppings. It could be spicy, it could be sweet, it could be a cherry, it could be other types of fruit. And I would kind of always go for the condensed milk with coconut shavings on top and a cherry, or I would do the blue one because all the cool guys, because I want to fit in, you know, as elementary school, uh, I would do also do the blue um, raspado with different, like, uh, it was kind of like the red American flag. It was like white, red, and um, blue, and he would put a little cherry on top, and that I thought it was cute. And so I wanted to fit in with everyone. Everyone got that one. So that's my memory. My core memory was a raspado man across the street um, at school. Made to order too, right? Yeah, I mean, he totally. assembles the whole thing. Exactly. It's fresh. And I know other cultures have shaved ice, like Hawaiian shaved ice mm -hmm. and other, you know. Japan. Exactly. Yeah. So, you know, a little bit for everyone. Yes, definitely. Um, that's a great memory. Thank you so much for sharing. Yeah, thank you for us. sharing yours. Yeah. And um, I really like the fact that uh, you talked about the different flavors that were prevalent uh, with the uh, raspados in that respect. And it reminds me, actually, of one of our panelists. Yeah. Uh, and uh, if you don't mind. Uh, of course. And who, who uh, tasted the tocumbo ice cream with the ice cream cart? Yeah. All right. Cool. We. We got that. We'll get the noise going. All right. So let's introduce Jennifer Claus and Quiros, who co owns Tocumbo Ice Cream, a small batch Mexican style ice cream shop in Anaheim. It was founded by her immigrant family and is seeking ways to grow and strengthen the business with her brother as her parents transition into retirement. She wants to lead by example as an entrepreneur in the local Latino community. Welcome, Jennifer. Thanks for having me. Jennifer came all the way from Anaheim and uh, braved the traffic to be here today. So Thanks we, for including Orange County. We, <laughs> we really, really appreciate it uh, in that respect. Uh, next, we have some folks who didn't have to come from too, too far away in that respect. And that are that is the folks from Kinrose Cre Creamery. Uh, we have Maria Orovesi and Mo Kamal. Maria and Mo's ice cream journey began when they moved to L.A. in 2020 during the pandemic. And they noticed Ellie's appreciation for food and culture, something we know a little bit about. Yum. And they wanted to demystify the cultural approach to food uh, that they grew up on. Uh, the goal for their ice cream is to make these complex and sophisticated flavors more accessible. Their entrepreneurial spirit fed by the desire to create their own Middle Eastern ice cream band. Mm -hmm. After three years of pop-ups and catering, they found themselves in charming Old Down Pasadena. Marie and Mo. Welcome. Thank you for Thank having you. us. Thank you for having us. And last but not least, uh, Amber Tan, who shouts out the 626 Hospitality. Hey. And it's actually behind the name. Let's explain a little bit about 626. It is inspired by the neighborhood we grew up in, the San Gabriel Valley, a.k.a. 626. At the end of 2020, Amber, along with her partner, Waldo Tan, set out to make the world a little sweeter. And on this journey, an expected group of friends set out to build a dream together. Drawing from a combination of a past experience, culinary curiosity, and heritage, our team began to distill our ethos, community-inspired, chef-driven. Our flavors represent the cultures of our hometown, of our, and our mission remains to honor the flavors and friendliness of our neighborhood in every bite. That sounds yum already. Yes. Welcome, Amber. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. So we've got a couple of questions that we've prepared today, but uh, we're also going to get a chance for you folks to uh, ask some questions from our great panel here today. Um, but Amber, I thought maybe we could start out with you, if that's okay. Sounds great. Because uh, <laughs> I think this next question sort of ties into your bio, but would love to hear from everybody else. Um, so Amber, maybe you could share with us some ice cream memories of your own, and how do they kind of relate to your current style of ice cream that you make at 626? Great question. So I'd say um, I was actually thinking about this. One of my first memories was actually with my family and specifically my dad. My dad has a gnarly sweet tooth and we mm. love taking a trip to Costco. Um, and like, you know, there's obviously samples, but our favorite time was the last aisle, the freezer aisle. He was a fanatic for any new treats there, whether it be the Kirkland, like, you know, like um, fudge bars, like the new up and coming like mochi ice cream. But back like way when I was a child, obviously, like there was, I think his favorite was the haagen Crunch Bar. So that became like my favorite. And then obviously like the um, drumstick. 
So for me, that's kind of like where a lot of my first memories come from. Um, you know, just like, uh, like just memories of like happiness and just excitement when you like go up to the freezer door like oh my gosh is there anything new here like oh I've tried that one oh the drumstick now has like an inner core you know those like kind of things <laughs> or there's a strawberry eclair now so we've tried the chocolate one you know so things like that so I think when it comes to making our ice cream um, it's really about just capturing that same happiness right so I like to think that ice cream is like the happiest food in the world when you're sad you know ice cream makes it better and when you want to celebrate you have ice cream ready to celebrate with so regardless of how you're feeling in the day um, ice cream is a way to kind of bring that happiness forward and so that's kind of what we try to do when we like share our flavors make our ice cream to kind of just make the world like a slightly happier place one bite at a time essentially i love it i love it marie and mo hi hi <laughs> Um, well, for me, so actually, um, it started my, both my parents went, actually met um, in grad school at the University of Wisconsin. So as you can imagine, they really, um, you know, ice cream was like a very big thing. I mean, that's just, for them in the 70s, uh, they, ice cream dates were like a thing, uh, were the only mm -hmm. thing. And so um, I think just growing up, I mean, they were very big on always, even if we went out anywhere to grab dinner, we always had to stop by somewhere and try something new, like a new ice cream place. Uh, so it was definitely something that like started uh, at a very, very young age that my parents, uh, they definitely like just sort of uh, brought into our like household. And so um, I think some of these like flavors and some of these just like, the, you know, the quality and sort of like the things that they always talked about, um, I think still resonate with me. And so I think I, I certainly try to implement them uh, whenever we're trying to like try or make any, something like new. Yeah. His dad, when we started the ice cream journey, was the happiest person on the planet. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. I mean, it rang into his childhood and his, well, not childhood, but his like youth, definitely, <laughs> and being in college. So that I know for sure. And they were just here recently visiting us and seeing the shop. And they both his parents were just so gleeful. It was yeah. so cute. <laughs> <laughs> they were. I love that. Jen, what about you? Uh, kind of same for me. It kind of started with my family, of course. Besides running after the paletero, paletas were always at home. But I remember loving ice cream because we would get it every Friday. We'd all go to this place called Thrifty's Ice Cream. Yes. Yes. And we'd get, we yes. would go. We didn't have one in Anaheim. We would go to Buena Park. Ooh. And we'd get in the car, go get our Thrifty's Ice Cream, mm. and then just drive home. And then we do it again the next Friday and my brother came home from the hospital my little brother after being born and it was a Friday and guess what we went and got ice cream that's <laughs> and now he's the main ice cream maker so I'm like it's a little full circle moment but oh. yeah I like to see that tradition kind of happen in our shop as well you know you see people coming after church or you know on Fridays also after the school week is over uh so we like to kind of see those traditions too like you know a lot of kids a lot of um a lot of older people in our community too that that's their outing that's their date night you know so it's kind of nice to be a part of that love it i love that everyone said a very specific memory you guys were like ready to go with that um <laughs> and i think that's just it's a special it's not a dish it's a special treat to have you know ice cream um i do want to kind of recognize that we've had waves of different frozen treats um, we had Froyo back in the day. It was, a, it was a thing that that was when I was in high school, and I was like, okay, what do we do? You know, I wasn't out partying, and I wasn't in that doing that. So I was going to get Froyo with my friends, right? Um, then there was the gelato was like the craze, and everyone wanted to be cool and get gelato for a date or whatnot. Um, a few years ago, we began to see boutique shops like Cool House and Salt and Straw expanded. Now there's like a Salt and Straw, Salt Salt and Straw in West Hollywood, which I'm like, oh, that's really interesting. In the middle of like all the clubs and bars, um, <laughs> so I want to ask each of you, where are we at with the ice cream in Southern California? What have you seen, and and how has it been rooted in the in the last few years? So let's go back with Jennifer. Why don't you start and what you've seen throughout you know the last few months, maybe the last year with ice cream? I mean, I've, we've been in business almost seven years, thankfully, and when we first started, I don't remember seeing any Michoacanas in Orange County, mm. and now I'm, I don't know if you guys have a Pasadena, maybe not, um, but 
They're everywhere now. It's like Starbucks and. And Michoacanas are like a Mexican flavored ice cream shop, right? Yes. So they Michoacan is a state in Mexico, and there's a little town there called Tocumbo, which is what we're named after. And in this town, everybody makes ice cream. Almost everybody. That's how they make their livelihood. Paletas ice cream. That's where they left, franchised, went to Chicago, and are now here. Um, but now it's kind of like putting, you know, Philly cheesesteak out there. Like you can't really trademark it. So everyone's like, oh my God, everyone knows what Michoacana is. So they kind of grew out of control because then there were different franchises happening. Um, so it's good because it brought awareness like to our shop. Um, our family has been doing this for 23 years in San Diego and they didn't have Michoacanas till I think last year. Interesting. Um, because San Diego, there's such a big ice cream like world out there. Mm. Um, but it's good because they know what it is now and they understand paletas. They're like, what is this? Is this ice cream? I'm like, yeah, you've never seen a popsicle before kind of thing. <laughs> but, um, you know, sometimes people come in and they're like, oh, what is this? Is this part of Michoacana? And it's like, we have to explain to mm -hmm. them, but at least they have some sort of understanding that in Mexico we make good ice cream. Mm -hmm. And, you know, sometimes they come in here and like, well, is this, is this act real ice cream? Like thinking maybe it's gelato or frozen yogurt or whatever and i'm like yeah it's real good ice cream yeah. doesn't matter what it is it's real good ice cream so i think that's what i've seen a lot of lately <laughs> and in, in my community and in tucumbo speaking of in tucumbo the the city the, i believe there's a, a monument yeah. can you can you explain to the audience about the monument real yes quickly? so when you're driving into the town of tucumbo there's a big globe and the globe is on a waffle cone it's giant, you guys, just Google it. It's on a waffle cone and there's little paletas as the continents and things. It's like insane and that's the main month. And there's this tocumbo in big letters and every December they have Feria de las Paletas where they have a whole parade and all the paleterias get together and like give out free ice cream and they have a big carnival. They even have a paleta princess and queen. It's like insane, guys. It's, it's, it's let's there. Go. It's Come on, there. let's go right now. Oh my let's God, go. yeah, let's we go. should plan it. Yes, field trip. trip. <laughs> Maria? Ramon? Oh, where the culture yeah, is. Yeah, sorry. Culture. I was thinking about the <laughs> question. Ice cream. <laughs> what, are you, what are you seeing? Um, so I think, yeah, to kind of piggyback off of what she was saying, it was just kind of, I think what we're noticing now in the LA ice cream, so Southern California, ice cream culture is that there's a lot of representation for that amazing diversity that LA has to offer. And I think that is where we're seeing these amazing cultural sort of flavors come to life. And I think through social media also, there's just a lot more um, awareness to certain of these, like certain flavors that's driving people to be adventurous. And just for an example for us, we have our Lava Shack ice cream which I'm sure anybody that has TikTok here will probably know what Lava Shack is. I mean, it is this, anybody in Iran will know what it is, but it's crazy because on TikTok it went crazy viral. And what it is, it's basically like a fruit roll up, but it's a, it's made with real fruit and there's not that much sugar. So the idea that it is very tardy. And so that went viral right around the time that we opened and we had already planned to have that as one of our flavors. Wow. So when people came in, a lot of people already knew what that was. And that was just great because it's providing them, it's a little less work for us <laughs> because yeah. it's already out there. But I think just people are aware of it and I think it's creating this beautiful uh, desire to try these new and new flavors that are that you can't find at every other shop or mm -hmm. every other ice cream shop and whatnot. So you'll see like someone like 626 that does amazing flavors. You guys do great flavors. And it just all is representative of just everyone that's probably here, some heritage, some culture. And there's a lot of interconnectivity also, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. is great because we were talking about it. They have arroz con leche. We have shir arroz. Arroz is also oh. rice in Arabic. Right. So we have that and that, like, you know, a lot of people that are familiar with both are like, oh, this is like arroz con leche or this is like rice pudding. And, you know, it's just, it, there's a lot of interconnectivity. So I love that word. We love that. I think one thing I just, <clears throat> I think part of the reason why uh, it's possible for all these different ice cream places, I think also the um, people here in Southern California are very adventurous. Uh, we've noticed that certainly that um, 
yeah, they're willing to try something new. I mean, we have a lot of people that come into the shop and they ask us questions. They want to be very familiar, uh, more familiar with like what they're having. Or So I think they're just that sort of foodie or adventurous um, sort of trait, I think helps also uh, push uh, like a lot of these like diverse ice cream concepts to kind of thrive. Yeah. And sh the sharing of, of also like, whether it's flavors or even space, right? Yeah. And being able to go back and forth with things. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, Amber, what do you think? Uh, what are you, what, in your orbit, maybe from the 626, maybe there's something, in, a microcosm in 626 you want to highlight. Yeah, I mean, these guys stole all my answers. So now I'm trying <laughs> to think of a new one. Um, but no, I think uh, it's it's really beautiful, actually. Like in Los Angeles, um, it's very vast. There's a lot of cultures all over. I mean, look at this panel, right? Um, I was actually sharing that we actually went to Tuku my partner, Walden, I actually went to Tucumbo on the way to a wedding. Um, and, oh. you know, we were actually Googling like a lot of the flavors there. There were fruits I have never heard of. Um, but kind of like exactly what you guys said, like I think people in Los Angeles and greater Orange County area, they're excited. They're willing to try. And it's really great. Um, whereas before, you kind of had to pull teeth, like, you know, this flavor is really good. Like, it's not vanilla, it's not chocolate, it's not strawberry, and not knocking those beautiful flavors, because I grew up with those flavors. But the world is such a big place, and there's so much, like, exciting, like, flavors to try. And so it's really amazing to see, like, for example, at our um, soft serve shop, we have a flavor called Honey Misugaru. And Misugaru is, like, a blend of Korean grains and rices, and, you know, probably pre-pandemic, like I don't know if people would have been willing to try something of that nature. But nowadays, if I say, oh, it's honey misugaro, and then it actually kind of tastes like a cereal milk, like, okay, it's foreign, but there's some a little bit of approachability, kind of like the things you guys were talking about. And I just feel like it's really nice to kind of see like how people can kind of create these flavors and showcase them to people, like especially because a lot of these flavors that we make are from memories of our own childhood growing up, people we've met along the way. Um, so specifically for 626, um, you know, we have a really diverse culture within our small little like area, like in literally in the same block, you can get some of the best dim sum and dumplings and you can walk across the street and there's the alote man and like there are, <laughs> you know, really great tacos. And so, you know, I feel very fortunate to also be a product of San Gabriel Valley. I am. Chinese, Filipino, and Hispanic. So um, there's just a lot of really great, um, like you guys said, diversity, representation. And I think um, being able to showcase that through not just food and like savory cooking, but also through desserts makes, I think, the LA landscape very exciting. Amen. <laughs> yes, I love that. I think, uh I think you just sold us on an Arcadia food crawl, yeah. you know, yeah. <laughs> to make that happen. It's really good, guys. You should definitely go. I love it. all the spots. So, um, Kind of returning to w a lot of what we've talked about with memories and nostalgia, are there any like, you know, reactions that you receive from some of your customer base, you know, in terms of your ice cream? Uh, Maria Mo, uh, maybe we could start with you as far as that goes. Uh, yeah, we, I mean, it's very interesting how some some people come into the shop and, and they tell us that if they taste something and that how this reminds them of home, mm. uh, wherever that may be. And so I think that is the, for us, it is the warmest compliment that we can receive. Uh, one of the things that I think was like a very specific memory that I thought was very fascinating, and I didn't even know this, was that we, you know, one of our ice creams, we have this like specific cotton candy that is also, uh, that is very famous in the Middle East. Uh, in Iran, they call it Pashmak, and, you know, in Arabic language, they call it Ghazl Banat. And so we had um, a lady that came in, and she tried it, and it, I mean, she just, I mean, it unlocked this, like, core child memory for her. And she said, I had this exact same thing in Hong Kong 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. And that was, and she's like, and we call it Dragon's Beard. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't know that this was something that was also really, I mean, this was also a learning ex a lesson for me to, like, know that uh, in Hong Kong, they had something very similar exactly, and they called it Dragon's Beard. Um, so I think she really was just so, I mean, it, you could just almost see the inner child, uh, you know, just come out. Uh, I would say that that was, uh, was a very, very interesting experience and interaction with, uh, and learning for both of us. Yeah. Love that. What about you, Jen? Um, for us, exactly the same. Yeah. yeah. Where you don't realize that there are other cultures that have 
the same thing, but just name it differently or mm. introduce to them differently. Um, but for me, I love seeing the older people in the community that maybe have left their home country. And it, it's like that, my friend Sean and I call it the Ratatouille moment, if anyone's Aww. seen that movie, where it just literally yeah. transports you to your childhood. And there was a gentleman today, it's the same thing, like the arroz con leche. I brought that, was my that's my favorite flavor. And so I brought it because it reminds me of my grandma making the rice pudding and you know, me debating whether I want the raisins in it or not. And so <laughs> today we had that same discussion and he's half Puerto Rican. And so it was just kind of that that moment of that sharing. And also we have a big Vietnamese community in Garden Grove, which we're really close by. And so just even learning to say some of the flavors in Vietnamese, because that's how they know them. And so they're teaching me ways to say it as well so that I can help the next, you know, Vietnamese customer that I have. So it's exactly like you know blast from the past for them i love that it's almost like you're learning more about yourself from Absolutely. the customer base oh, yeah. in that Absolutely. respect yeah and it kind of solidifies like okay we're doing the right thing we have these flavors that they might be look scary at first <laughs> or they might be smelly when we're making them but i know people <laughs> there's a customer out there that's gonna be very happy that we have it <laughs> what about you amber um just like they said you know like we like all of us make ice cream, I think, to kind of re-remember like past memories, to help people unlock old memories and then create new memories. Mm -hmm. um, so specifically for us, like a really big, um, you know, like sigh of relief was when we actually made that, uh, the sake kasu ice cream that I hope you guys enjoyed. Um, so that good. one um, is, thank you, thank you. Um, <laughs> that one was actually a, um, a gift. Um, so what I mean by that is it was my 31st birthday and we, we're a little rambunctious in the tasting room, and so we came, we took up most of the tasting room, and so we Waldo and I came back to give the head brewer um, some ice cream as a, hey, I'm so sorry for taking up literally most of your tasting room, but here's some ice cream, like, thank you so much, we had a great time. And the packaging was a little, like, you know, unlabeled, it was, like, very new, like, we had just started making ice cream. And um, he looked at it, it was like, because it was handwritten, like, it just said, like, I think at the time we were making hojicha, and I think, um, coconut pandan, and he said, like, who made this ice cream? And we're like, oh, we did. He's like, one second. And he literally, like, went away. And he came back with a giant bucket, and he's like, can you do something with this? And I had no idea what he brought out, and apparently it was kasu. And so kasu is, like, a um, fermented, like, rice product from when, like, you make, like, sake. It's, like, the leftover rice. Mm. And so he said, like, can you make an ice cream with this? And we looked at him, like, I don't know, but we'll do our best. <laughs> and so, you know, we went home, tested some stuff out, brought it back, nervous, obviously. We're like, okay, I think it tastes pretty good, but like, I don't know what he's looking for. So we brought it back to him, and the moment he tried it, he actually like closed his eyes, and he teared up a little bit. And I was like, I hope this is a good thing. <laughs> and so, you know, we let him kind of think about it a little bit, and he opened his eyes, and was like, this reminds me when I was a young adult, when I was learning to make sake and beer. And I was like, Oh shoot, so he explained that like when he was learning, there was a little tiny ice cream store right next to the sake brewery that he was lear um, learning at. And he said after work, him and his master would like go to this ice cream place and eat ice cream afterwards. And so for us, we were like, wow, like that's crazy that this literal award-winning brewery uh, sake maker, like we transported him back to a core memory for when he started making, like, making sake. So kind of like everyone here, it's just like, it is really beautiful to be able to kind of create that kind of like platform for people to like really take themselves back, um, really relish in like these moments that like they kind of maybe have even forgotten. Um, and so it is very rewarding when like we can see people like maybe make connections and then let's say they're on a date, it's like, oh, I had this when I was a child, so now you get to have it as an adult and we can like <laughs> join together and like talk about this forever. So, you know, Food is, like they said, it's a connector. And so whether it's connecting with old memories, um, creating new memories with friends, it's, I think, what makes food, and specifically ice cream, a really great time. What, what was the brewery? I'm just curious. Oh, thank you. So sorry. No, it's um, It's okay. called um, Nova Brewing Company in West Covina. Really, okay. really great stuff. So highly recommend. I can even go there after this, maybe. So Yeah. <laughs> Another Let's field trip. Everybody. God, you're taking me the next time, right? For our Let's, next go. Episode. <laughs> Let's go. Let's <laughs> go. Um, you know, I'm always curious, you brought up TikTok earlier, and I remember seeing what you're talking about, and I'm like, I don't know what it's called, but that, that looks, sounds so familiar. 
Um, now that we have a lot of social media, um, whether you all have it on your own accounts or it is just fans of ice cream or just people around the world, I want to know what's like the behind the scenes in the ice cream ice cream making pro- process. Um, can you give me a little bit of a walkthrough of your day in the life of your chef hands or your entrepreneur spirit? I kind of want to go with Maria and Mo first because y'all have a business background, right? And then you flourish into the space of ice cream making. Um, right. So yeah, tell us a little bit about the little back- background you guys have and then tell us about the bi- behind the scenes of your ice cream shop. Maria, you're an excellent TikTok follow, by the way. If, <laughs> if you need to follow Maria, you, you all need to follow Maria. Oh, thank you. Um, so actually, my background is my family, since I was four years old, has had an Iranian ice, uh, an Iranian restaurant out on the East Coast. They're in Northern Virginia. And um, they that's actually where my mom began making the saffron ice cream, which is a very, very, very traditional Iranian flavored ice cream. And she started making it then. And that is like our background has just always been in the food space. I went to school. I was going to do law, and but I was really interested in business law. And I've always been interested in like the corporations and how they work and whatnot. And then um, now I'm here. <laughs> but <laughs> did did that, got my MBA, was doing like business consulting, financial consulting, and the pandemic happened and Mo and I got into this like realm just because of the saffron ice cream. We've always been told at the restaurant that, hey, you guys should package this. This is great. You can't find it in stores. It's not uh, novel, whatnot. So that was always in the back of our mind. And then I think during the pandemic, we were like, well, this seems like a good time to try this. And that's how we kind of started. Um, and I'll let Mo tell, tell you about his background too. Yeah. I, interesting. Uh, so I'm, I'm a bioengineer by, by training. And, um, I also, uh, I actually met Maria when we were both doing our MBA as well. Uh, and so I was working and this was in DC. I was working in the national Institute of health. And so I ended up actually just, yeah, during the pandemic, just kind of quitting, um, and just had the, something during the pandemic just gave me the courage to kind of explore this entrepreneurial side. I guess I was bitten by the entrepreneurial bug. <laughs> and so um, we thought when we moved here to California, we, uh, you know, again, we we thought that maybe just the saffron ice cream was like a good, you know, a good concept to like explore. We thought that really was just something, um, something that was just like really activating this sort of creativity uh, in us. And so we thought we what essentially started as, yeah, like just like a really fun hobby, uh, eventually grew into this uh, into this like very uh, into this concept right now. And so seeing it sort of like going through this like path, uh, we're very just I mean, honestly, it's just it's it's amazing and it's so exciting. Yeah. And it was like so that we, we used to do our a day in a life would kind of look something like this. We would. We had a commercial kitchen in downtown LA, which is brutal to get to. (laughs) And we would go there, we would make the ice cream, pack everything up, and we would do smorgasbord because that was our first like routine event that we had. We would do caterings all the time, but that was the constant, especially during the summers. And we would make ice cream there. We had like a four hour window that we had to make everything. So there was no breaks. Like it was just, man, it, it would be seriously brutal. Now it looks a little bit more laid back, just <laughs> longer hours. <laughs> so now we go in early in the morning, we get all of our deliveries, get all that set up, and then we make the ice cream throughout the day. And if you ever come by the shop, one of us is probably in the back making ice cream. And mm-hmm. so that's just, it's just a long day's work. We split it up by certain flavors, one with nuts, one without nuts. <laughs> um, and we also have a Egyptian mint chip ice cream, which is made with so- orchid root. So it has, the texture is a little bit stretchy, and that one is takes the longest to make. Um, it takes about an hour and a half of just churning. So wow. before it goes into even the freezing phase to give it, you have to release the, basically the stretch part of it. And so it just depends on which day, but yeah, it pretty much out, out in the back making ice cream, then coming in the front and helping the team, going back into the back, cleaning up, so... 
it's pretty much a 12 to 14 hour day. All hands on deck. All hands oh, on deck. Yes, yeah. Uh, Amber, how's your day in life? Well, actually, my partner Sogu and I actually were making ice cream all day today, so I <laughs> uh, totally understand what you guys are talking about. So Dana Life is that um, consistency is very important to us. So we literally measure everything by the gram just because, you know, we would hate for someone to come in, like love this ice cream, and then the next time they come, the ice cream is different. And, like, you know, for us, that's really bad just because we want to make sure that every time someone has this flavor, it's the same. So we will go in, we'll measure everything to the gram, like they mentioned, cook everything. Um, our commercial kitchen's actually all the way in the OC, just because we have wow. a really small shop, so it wasn't big enough to fit our batch maker, or yeah, batch freezer, so we cook everything, we ship it off to the OC, and I am the delivery person as well. Mm. Um, so I'm the one bringing everything over, and then with the helpful hands of, of course, Sogu and a couple of our teammates, um, we churn the ice cream, and I do a lot of quality control, so we are eating like easily like a half a pint, a pint of ice cream every time. Just because again, you just have to make sure it's tasting the same and really good. So Hardware. by the time we're like, <laughs> by the time we're done making ice cream, I'm like really full like from eating so much ice cream. Um, but again, like, you know, at, at the end of the day, it's just like, it's a labor of love. It really is. Like regardless if it's like a 10 hour day, 14 hour day, it's like, okay, even though I'm really tired, even though like I could technically be doing something else, like... It's really just making sure that like what our mission is, is creating like, again, memories and ice cream. It starts from the very beginning. And so after I'm done trying like pints of ice cream, like we'll either package it into like um, bigger containers for either restaurant partners or like uh, events like today, or put them in the cute little pint ice creams that we sell all across like LA. Um, but yeah, it's pretty much what our day looks like. Very similar to these guys, just working nonstop, making sure the world is, has access to delicious ice cream. <laughs> Aww. And Jennifer, do you have anything to add? Because yours, um, yours are paletas. They might be a little slightly different than the ice cream that they make. Yes, be so sim exactly like them. Start early, start <laughs> picking fruit, chopping it, waiting for deliveries, all that. But we've a little bit outgrown our kitchen because now my mom and dad are retired, and so they're helping us make paletas. So imagine your mom, your dad, your brother, and yourself Try not to step over each other oh. and <laughs> be cordial and it's summer and there's no it's ice hot. cream. Yes. You know, the the ice cream makers breaking down. Yeah, it's the five year warranty thing is real, just so mm. you know. But um, but yeah, I worked in corporate before and during the pandemic, I was just that like I wanted I didn't know what the future of the ice cream shop was gonna be. So kind of same. I just said, let me make sure my brother and my family is okay. So it just thankfully took that leap and I wouldn't change it for the world. It's it's a lot of hard work. Uh, making ice cream is heavy work. Um, a lot of lifting, I realized. My brother helps a lot, but now he's he's out of town and I'm, I'm having to make the ice cream and a lot of quality control like you. So um, ice cream. Yeah, my team will tell me if I'm if it's not right. So you know, you know, giving away some pints of ice cream of the, the rejects, um, but exactly that. It's 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 chaos and it's like a beautiful disaster. But at the end of the day, everyone's happy that there's beautiful, delicious ice cream. Yeah, and I will say this is like the making of the ice cream. There's still marketing, so TikTok, Instagrams. There's like emails corresponding with Gob to be on the panel. So I'm sure there's a lot of behind the scenes that we don't know as business makers. So, But thank you so much for sharing your ice cream with us today. Um, us. We do have two more questions at least. Yeah. Um, <laughs> as we've discussed already, uh, culture is a massive part of the process for finding inspirations for your flavors. Could you tell us a little bit more about sort of what goes into that? You know, maybe something that we haven't touched on already or anything else you'd like to share under that heading as far as that goes. Yeah, so for our um, soft serve shop in Arcadia, um, we have a really small shop. Um, we only have enough for like six flavors um, at the shop just because it's actually soft serve, not ice cream, a little bit different, but you know, same love and care that go into it. Um, but you know, when it comes to finding inspiration for these flavors, um, because there's only six slots, we're thinking, okay, if there's a group of like five, 10 people, like, you know, they all, clearly everyone has different palettes. Um, so for us, it's making sure that there's like a balance of flavors that everyone hopefully can enjoy. 
So, you know, like for us, it's like, okay, what's something like really beautifully tart, bright, refreshing? So we kind of pull from like seasonality sometimes, you know, right now it's summertime, pineapple, passion fruit, hopefully you guys also like that flavor, it's really bright, refreshing. Um, thank you so much. Um, <laughs> And, you know, obviously, like, in the 626, um, ironically, it is probably the highest number of, like, lactose intolerant people, but also people <laughs> who are totally willing to just push through that. Um, Wait, but, how do you know that? Huh? How do you know that? <laughs> I just have this feeling, you okay. know? So, um, so for us, like, in our small shop, we always want to make sure there's at least, like, two non-dairy flavors, because I totally understand. Like, my, actually, my partner, who is our recipe developer, he is severely <laughs> lactose intolerant. So he wanted, yeah, Waldo is lactose intolerant. So wow. he wanted to make sure, like, Hey, I got you guys. So there's always going to be at least two dairy-free flavors available. So is he the one that put the lactate pills in the shop? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> that was, a, that okay, was so wait, wait, wait. So That's can you good. explain really quickly what this oh, is? Because so <laughs> we've discussed even writing a a, a a trend piece about this, but oh. walk us through what the. Because other people do it too. But, but yeah, so um, as like a funny joke, because again, 626 has a lot of unfortunately lactose intolerant people, we ended up putting like a little candy dispenser that has lactate pills in it. So you can come in, <laughs> pop in a lactate, have, have a blast regardless of what flavor you guys get. Um, but yeah, so that's a little bit about that. Do you um, have to pay the quarter? It's a... You do still have to pay so the quarter. So you're making some so revenue off experience. of this, right? Yeah, yeah it's the okay, real good, deal. Like good. you have to put the real quarters in there and everything. Yeah. So... Um, but yeah, so you know, when it comes to like creating flavors, like like I mentioned earlier, like the honey misugaro, one of our teammates, Jung, um, he grew up like um, drinking misugaro as like a child. And so he really wanted to kind of showcase that to like a, a wider audience. So we were really excited to put that out there. Um, one of the other flavors we do is a Yakult flavor. Um, and Yakult is seen across like all cultures. Like either you drink it by the little cup or you drink it as a sleeve. You know, if some someone was debating what one portion size was, and they were like, it's the sleeve, right? I'm like, dude, there's like eight containers in there. Okay. She's like, you don't just pop them all open and drink them. I'm like, no, it's one serving is one. She was like, no, no, no. <laughs> so whatever serving size you guys are used to, um, that's for you, you know, great job. But, you know, Yako is like, again, like a very childhood nostalgic flavor. And so, you know, it's like trying to balance like something that's sweet, tart, or like even creamy, like the honey misugaro, um, and just making sure that there's something for everyone. Because again, Everyone's palate is so different. Ironically, like, I do not really like tart flavors. I love rich, creamy. Like, I don't want any nutritional value in my dessert. <laughs> it must be only sugar, milk, butter, cream, no fruits anywhere. Um, so, you know, that's a small example of, like, the kind of inspiration we kind of, like, try to keep in mind for, like, when a family comes in, when, like, you know, first date comes in, you know, he might not want to share with her or vice versa. So... <laughs> Um, yeah, it's kind of like what we go into, like, you know, the 626, like I mentioned, is very vast. So there's just a lot of cultures to kind of, like, research and, like, pick up on and, like, represent. So it's at least what we try to do. Just, like, think about memories that we had growing up, um, people that we meet along the way that, like, really want to showcase, like, a very specific thing that they ate growing up. And we're like, you know what, let's do it. Let's try it. Let's see if, you know, we like it, see if how people respond to it. And that's kind of at least how inspiration strikes between like our team when it comes to making flavors and stuff. Thank you. Maria Mo? Um, yeah, I think for us kind of the same thing. We always think about what we can, how we can cater to each palette. Everyone is obviously very different. I am very much into personally into the tart flavors. I'm like Amber. <laughs> I'm into the tart and kind of more simply like simple flavors. So my Two favorite flavors at the shop are the Lava Shack, which is the pomegranate tamarind that's topped with pomegranate molasses. And then my other favorite is our rice pudding, which is our sheer arroz, and that has like a little bit of cinnamon on it. And I think I I've, I want to say probably, I can probably speak on behalf of Mo too when I say this, but all of our flavors have some connection to our childhood, our memories, our parents, someone cooking, an aunt, uncle, whatever. And I think we just take those flavors and we're like, okay, like for me, the rice pudding, same thing. I always watch my mom making it. And it was one of those that I'm like, we have to do it. It's going to be delicious. And it, every time I have it, it makes me think of her. And I think with like, with even our mint chip, that was kind of, that stemmed from his dad being in Wisconsin and his favorite flavor being mint chip and we were like okay how can we kind of egyptianify <laughs> this flavor and so we added the orchid root and kind of gave it that textural component um, but all of it yeah is pretty much derived from just our own things that we actually like you know and it's not 
just, okay, hey, we think this is going to do well. Like, it, we really have to believe in it and love it and be like, okay, if we were to go to an ice cream shop, is this something that we would try and have? And even if that's going into our vegan ice cream, which is our sesame halva. And halva is a, a Middle Eastern confectionery kind of candy. It's made with sesame and flour and sugar. And that is, it's, it's a unique flavor. And we spent some time, I was telling somebody here, um, we spent like about three, four months just kind of creating that flavor and making sure it was perfect. So everything has to be something that te- like resonates, that, with, yeah, us. resonates with us. Yeah. Love that piece of you guys definitely yeah jen yeah i totally relate to what these guys are saying 100 percent. and our recipes that are from our family and from this town they're all pretty purist so if you go to our shop there's there aren't a lot of ice creams that we offer that are mixed flavors like we don't really mix passion fruit with pineapple even though i would love that and so a lot of that is just tradition and what we're used to and and having our customer decide if they want to mix you know mango with coconut or mango with queso and so it's just up to them to kind of how they want to do it but also my brother and I were really really strict about that like we have to keep you know tradition and honor the paletero and and whatnot but now it's also okay well we're going into year seven and we kind of have our own culture in Orange County too and then there's these other flavors that play a, a part in our lives and our community and they'll come and ask like why don't you have a matcha why don't you have a new bay and it's like i don't know how to prepare matcha and i don't want to just you know do a half job of anything i want it to be great so if we do something like that it'd be nice to collaborate with people that are really you know i know some people exactly mm-hmm. like people that really know what they're doing yeah. and together. yeah and to honor you know other cultures too and bring them forward and being able to offer that to our customers like that'd be really cool and that's kind of something that we want to work towards and kind of have like four spots or th- you know two or four spots for something like that or something more playful yeah. When you do do the collab, just make sure to invite me and Brian to the the media preview. Yes. Okay, so you we can, can come down. Sample. And, yes. Yes, you can be please. the taste testers. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Oh yeah, professional taste testers. It'll be a whole love production. That. We'll get you t-shirts. Really yeah. cool. I love it. Brian's can't have sleeves though. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Dang. Sorry. He got me there. He got me there. So I do want to open this time for Q and A. Um, all I want to uh, end uh, this portion of the of the art questions is just. I, it's lovely to see that everyone is from a different culture on the stage and you're still honoring your traditions while serving the greater Southern California community and, and bringing flavors or traditions or even stories from different um, countries or different regions of, of the United States into your shops and honoring those. So thank you so much for that. And I just want to give you a little thank ha- you. applause thank to you. all of you guys here. Thank you. Um, and so now we could get some help from the event staff to do a little bit of a Q&A. If anyone has questions for anyone, and please let them know your name um, and What's for it? whom the question is for. Yeah. Uh, my name is Edward. This question is for the panel. Uh, what are your most popular flavors? So uh, currently, our most, most popular flavors is actually the sake kasu, which is why we wanted to bring it today. Um, pineapple passion fruit is actually one of our newest sorbets, and um, people are really enjoying that because it's again very tart, refreshing, perfect for summer. Mm-hmm. Um, right now at our store, um, I'd say our most popular flavor is going to be our hojicha or our matcha. Um, we actually get the tea straight from Kagoshima, Japan, because for us, really having great authentic like tea is really important. Um, so yeah, I'd say like in ice cream land, it's going to be the sake and whatever like bright, tart, beautiful, refreshing flavor we have. And then currently at our storefront is probably going to be the hojicha or matcha. Um, and then the we have a lychee strawberry as well there, dairy free. Um, but yeah, that's a really good one too, because like we really enjoy just like mixing things together. Um, the lychee strawberry was like made for like actually twins um, for a birthday party when we first started in COVID. Like one twin wanted lychee, the other twin wanted <laughs> strawberry and they did not want to compromise. So like, you know, we got you. Let's like try like a lychee strawberry and hopefully they like it. Unfortunately they did, so yeah. Yeah, happy accident. 
And for us, um, one of the, I mean, one of the top flavors we have is the walnut baklava. Yeah, so good. So good. So good. <laughs> Thank you. It's my Thank favorite. Thank you. Round of applause. Uh, we're, we really are very happy and I'm proud of this flavor because also um, there really aren't that many places that even Middle Eastern ice cream uh, places that make actually um, all the ingredients that go in a baklava dessert into an ice cream, which is something that we do and we're very proud of. And I think that's what really helps uh, differentiate it among like uh, all the other ice cream flavors. And then I would say... Yeah, the other one is our sour cherry and fairy floss, which we also brought here today. Yeah. So that good. one, <laughs> thank, you. thank you. And that one is definitely, I think, it, it's definitely an experience. And what I love about that one, you can get all generations that love it. You know, mm. you'll get the younger to the older and they all appreciate it. I think there's a little bit of something, a, a little bit of everything for everyone in that specific flavor. And for us, I would say for ice cream, the limon, which is very reminiscent of the lemonade one you guys had today. Mm. And we, nice. those are Mexican key limes that we use. Mm. Um, mango as well. And um, we have one called chongos, which is a dessert that they make in Zamora, Michoacan. And those guys take like five hours to make. Oh, um, and wow. it's, what is it? It's very similar to arroz con leche. So you basically cook the milk and the cinnamon the sugar and it curdles like you're making cheese. And that's how you eat the dessert. But we put it in ice cream and paletas. And that's Sounds like, so that's the one flavor that like, if you get someone from there, they're like, well, you have chungos. Let's see. Let's see if it's <laughs> like, let's see. Let if me it rate tastes it right. for you. Pretty much. Yeah. yeah. And it's like someone's uncle and they're like terrifying. <laughs> yeah. But um, so those um, and then honestly, cookies and cream, we make a pretty good cookies and cream. Okay, and I always like I don't want to like tell people that because I want them to try other things. But it's so good. I've seen a picture of it. It's, it, it's like a whole Oreo, right? Yes. That's in there? Yes. Yeah, that's... yeah. They got the mini version, but we yeah. in the shop, we have the full full Oreo in full there. Full on Oreo. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Love it. Good question, by the way. Thank you. Thank you for yeah. that. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, y'all. My name's Hallie, and I have a question for the panel. Uh, if you have a disagreement with your partners on how a flavor should turn out, how do you settle it? Oh, I want to hear some tea. Oh. It's therapy now, okay? I know. We take it to the ring. I'm ah. okay. <laughs> um, honestly, thankfully, I don't think we've crossed that point yet. But I think we pretty much are. I think one thing that we both value, and you know, we're also husband and wife, so I think this just kind of, you know, it can complicate it, and it. You know, I think we're fortunate enough to not have it be that way. I think we're very respectful of each other's opinions. And I think at the end of the day, we want, we're want we a team. And I think we always remember that we're on the same team. And at the end of the day, we, um, we, want it, we want it to be the best version. So if one of us doesn't believe that, we value each other enough to be like, OK, then maybe I'm not or he's not. Like, we're not catching on to something. So I think that's. One thing that I think we always like ask ourselves is like, okay, does this is this in line with what we believe is like, you know, is this in is it, is this in brand with like what we have? So we ask ourselves that all the time, and so we both try to see if like whatever we're presenting, does it, you know, is it in line? Or is it in brand? And if it is or not, then we kind of try to like really work on it. But I think thankfully we try to really yeah, just I think understanding that it helps us. Uh, take 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 us both to like sort of like the best possible um, scenario. Yeah, Jennifer, you talked about working with your family. Yes, <laughs> my little brother. <laughs> Is he in the audience? No, okay. he's not. Uh, he's in Philly right now. But um, I'm the older sister, so I win. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> he, um, him, and I sometimes don't see eye to eye, but I think. Either he or I will break down if there's something that we really truly believe in, and kind of to your point, if it, if we could make it work in the values of you know what how we want to present our ice cream and what we want it to taste like, um, we'll do sample runs, we'll do different batches, taste it. Um, if the flavors aren't what they need to be, we just don't, you know, lot, our team goes home with a lot of <laughs> mediocre ice cream. It's still good, but it's, it's not what we want it to be, you know. Um, so I think to your point, it's a lot of collaborating and I'm, I love that part. Like I'm used to working with creative people and I'm more of like the logistics side of it. And so it's been really fun to see how to, how to make ice cream, how to put things together and how to complement things and 
maybe make things a little bit more Mexican than they should be, you know? <laughs> um, but definitely a lot of conversations, lots of taste testing for sure. For sure. Amber? Um, yeah, it's a great question, by the way. <laughs> that was a pretty funny one. Um, yeah, so usually if like my partner Waldo and I, because he is the recipe developer, but I am also a taster, a pretty important one if you ask me. Um, but let's say we really are stuck. We like, just like you guys mentioned, we do start asking staff like, hey, like what do you guys think? You know, are you on the right path with me? Or I'm just, as a joke, but just like you said, like a lot of staff will go home with lots of ice cream and you'll kind of like think about it. So like sometimes we need like a day, two days, or even to start the entire process over. Um, just cause again, like we wanna make sure that whatever flavor we put out there does represent like what we want it to represent. And so typically there's a lot of, some of our ice creams you guys are tasting like version, like I don't even know, like seven, <laughs> eight, nine sometimes. Mm. And so it just, again, collaborative effort, um, really trying to understand like what's the goal here? Like where, what's the flavor we're trying to capture? What's the memory we're trying to like share? Um, and as long as we just always remember like what's the point of us making this ice cream, it kind of just helps push along any like Luckily, the same, there hasn't been very many disagreements, fortunately, amongst our team, but you know, there will be preferences, like again, creamy versus yeah. tarts. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I think if even someone who doesn't like tart things can even enjoy, I think that's a really good happy medium. I will still go towards the vanilla, for example, but if I can like this, for example, like pineapple passion fruit as it is, um, you know, I think that's a really good sign. Yeah, you understand like the appreciation for it. Yeah, yeah. I just won't order it, respect, but I'll, yeah. like, I'll love it. <laughs> I think we have maybe for one more question. One more question. Hello, thank you. Um, this question Don't is give this man a mic. Oh boy. <laughs> is this karaoke? No. Um, question for everybody. You've talked a lot about the product, but can you talk about your physical spaces? Are there any like fun stories or things that have happened? I'm sure, you know, setting up your store itself is an experience, right? And so Customer experiences, getting your store actually set up, any stories we're sharing? <laughs> um, well, like physically what it looks like. <laughs> or Well, I know what you're saying. Yes. We have a lot of like hand-painted signs, things like that. But I think for us, it's important to m make it feel welcoming and so our team is like very much all about customer service. But besides that, we want to make sure that the ambiance is right. So we always have cumbias. We always have music going. So a lot of the times people come and dancing. Mm -hmm. And Aww. to the point where I had like a uh, security footage of so many people dancing that I made like a little like a little clip at the end of the year Those of all my customers oh, dancing, yeah. yeah. And it's okay. just like, the that makes me so happy because it's like, oh my God, it's like a party in here. I feel like this is what we listen to on Saturdays at my tia's party or whatever. So we always try to make sure that like the vibe is right. And if like the, si the sound goes off for whatever reason, I'm just like, I go in panic mode. I'm like, why is it silent? Like I can't. I can't sit there in silence, you know. I can't scoop in silence. <laughs> so, yeah, for sure, if you come in, you'll hear our cumbias, and it'll make you want to dance. I think a um, couple for us. Um, one of them was when we first started. So we did everything out of our own pockets. We didn't have any investment, none of, none of that. And I think when we first started, we the store <laughs> was just, it was like a concrete box, and... Every day we would go to the store and I would like, we would open up the car door, or Mo would open up the car door and he is bringing something else from the house oh. <laughs> to put it into the store. <laughs> so at the very beginning of our ice cream, like in January, the entire store was furnished by our house, oh. like furniture. <laughs> so that was really funny. And it was, he would take plants and just like all of a sudden the house would be bare. And I'm like, where did this go? And it's like, <laughs> sure enough at the store. So that's my funny story. <laughs> Um, another thing was that was pretty cool actually. So when we decided to actually uh, design the shop, we wanted uh, to just bring bright colors, uh, sort of like things that would just kind of sort of lighten up people when they come into an ice cream shop. And so we kept looking uh, through Facebook Marketplace, and we found um, this was like a very very fun story actually. There was this couple uh, that uh, the gentleman's mom was actually a set designer for a lot of Hollywood movies, and she would design furniture. So she was the set designer for the show The Fugitive, which I believe was in the 60s. 
Um, and so she designed those two chairs. And so they were really in theme. They were yellow. They were bright. Um, and so we asked them. We're like, hey, we're you know we have this like new ice cream shop. Uh, we, I, we think these two chairs would be really in line. And so they actually just gifted to us. Uh, I thought that was it was so cool, and it's just like it's carried on, and I think it's like a very fun story for us. Um, yeah. yeah. And it's always like one thing about having f furniture and pieces that mean a lot. Also, you get very sensitive when people are like, you know, like moving them around, and I'm always like, you mm -hmm. know, but <laughs> the, we and we have a few of those pieces, but it's always like like very great. I think our, our furniture now. <laughs> It's not from our house. Um, it is from other people's homes. Uh, <laughs> so and now it's, um, and a lot of those pieces mean, uh, like every piece that we picked out, especially in the chairs, have all, like have a little story with it. And I think that makes it very funky and makes it very cool. And we, there's also two Pac-Man machines. And if you're wondering how that got there, yeah. <laughs> it's all him. So, wait, so remind me again, uh, the style of the furniture? Uh, Memphis Milano. Memphis Milano. Yeah, it yeah. was like sort of like, it's like a retro vibes that kind of came out in the 80s, 90s that was like part of the, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a great little vibe, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, for us, I think um, we actually adopted our um, soft serve store from a, a, an older couple, actually. Um, long story short, um, Waldo and I had been having a lot of trouble finding a place to kind of call our ice cream home. Um, we had been searching for like half a year. Everything was a bust, either too expensive, too big. Same thing, we were bootstrapping everything. No investment, anything like that. So we were literally sad on a literal rainy day. And we're like, okay, I really need somewhere to go. Like, let's just Google or Yelp like ice cream near us. And we just so happened to be in Arcadia. And we stopped by this frozen yogurt shop called Ace Frozen Yogurt. So we walked in, there was no one in there, and so the older gentleman, so kind, started talking with us, and then he was saying how he's sad to retire soon. And we're like, oh, that's kind of strange. Most people are like, yeah, retirement. <laughs> um, so, you know, we kind of asked him, like, oh, may I ask, like, why you're so sad to retire? Um, and he was just saying, like, you know, my wife and I had spent so much time taking care of this shop, taking care of the guests here. We would just hate for it to turn into, like, another boba shop or, like, like a cop, just something completely different from what they were uh, already doing. So, you know, I was just like, okay, um, I looked at Waldo and I was like, this might be too forward, I don't know, but let's just take our chance. So he said, hey, like, if I'm being honest, like, my partner and I, we've been looking for a place to kind of, like, call our first storefront. Like, would you guys be open to us adopting the store from you? And he was pretty ecstatic because it was like, you know, we originally were going to, like, um, turn it into an ice cream shop because we started making ice cream. We still make ice cream, but, you know, we started negotiating and things were really amicable. They were actually able to retire sooner. Um, but we had already kind of made plans to, you know, like sell the soft serve machines. Um, but then I heard the quietest little voice. So I think the wife is very soft spoken. And I heard her say like, I hope they keep the machines. Oh. And I was like, oh, OK, <laughs> we're pivoting now. So then we ended up actually keeping the machines. Um, and so that actually became why, like, even though our ice cream shop is called 66 Ice Cream, we sell soft serve there as a way to pay homage to the previous business that we had bought it from. And what's really great, kind of like the furniture story, is that um, he, like the older Korean couple had like wanted to keep a lot of the furnitures in there. So there's one specific one, that same thing, as people touch it, I'm like, please don't touch it. <laughs> um, he, they had actually um, bought like this one cabinet on their wedding day in Korea. And so they brought it into the ice cream shop when they bought it. Um, and they wanted us to keep it. And we're like, oh my gosh, are you, are you sure? And so it's now like a focal point, like in our shop. And like, you know, again, it's just like, you know, this beautiful legacy of like, you know, bring, like honoring the old as we bring in the new. Um, and so I think like, that's what I think all of us are doing really amazingly. It's like taking these memories and like kind of refreshing them a little bit. Um, so how our shop kind of looks, it's like a little, um, like a little like, uh, like dark, a little darker, like kind of like moody. We wanted to set, kind of bring back like like Asian cinematography feel, like old Chinatown. So it's like moody and like kind of nice for like a late night date, you know? Because like we do open pretty late too, so that's also nice as well. But you know, it's actually really nice hearing people like, "Wow, this feels like I'm in a new like like I'm almost like in like a ride at Disneyland or something." Because it's just like very different than like what the outside looks like. Um, but yeah, so I think, you know, that's kind of like what our shop looks like. And I think, you know, I think that's why like ice cream is such a great vehicle for like these memories and things. So yeah, it's a little bit what our shop inside looks like. And, and you also have a, 
a curated playlist too, right? I mean, we do. You guys um, have shared it on. You shared the link on yeah. Spotify, right? Yeah. So if anyone wants to share our playlist or work from home with it, like we we're very open. Like you know, if you if you found enjoyment like in our shop, like please take the music home with you. We post like what playlists we have. Um, our teammate Jung, he was he's very proud of them. He's like, I've worked on some of these for a decade, and I'm like, I can wow. tell. They're so good. There's like a house one. There's like a like a jazzy one. There's like there's all sorts of playlists that he has. And yeah, so like for us, it's like if because obviously ice cream is not that great to go like unless it's like straight up frozen with dry ice. But like if you can't even if you can't take the ice cream like right then and there to go, like take another part of us. Take like the music. Take like the videos. You know, like that's so beautiful that you collected all of the dancing videos. It's like really cute. Um, and so, you know, for us, it's like, how can we keep sharing memories like outside of our immediate space? Yeah, so I think that's what we try to do. Oh, that was a beautiful way to wrap I things up that. here, I think, Gob. Yes. Are you yes. ready? I, I think we even went a little bit over time. So Sorry. Thank you so much for being a captive audience. And there's thank more you. ice cream. Oh, yes. And yes. there's more ice cream. Lots so more. let's all head thank out you. there. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you to our wonderful panel thank and you. your thank thoughtful you. responses. We really appreciate it. Thank, thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.